Bin Beya and Hamza Yusuf, they're part of this liberal hegemony. They're the religious face, the traditional Islamic face of that massive surveillance machine, that atheistic force that wants to wipe out religion off of the face of the earth. They are part of that, knowingly or unknowingly. But I think they know. Hamza Yusuf is not a dummy. Uh, Bin Beya uh, is a part of that. Hamza Yusuf is a part of that by virtue of working with these kind of government connected, government funded. That's why I'm telling you, like this kind of advocacy for religious freedom is just for the purpose of secularizing the Muslim world. That's the only purpose of it. This was the International Religious Freedom Summit of 2023. It happened on January 31st, so less than a week ago. The International Religious Freedom Summit was in Washington, D.C. It's I'm reading the description. The summit is intended to create a powerful coalition of organizations that operate together for the cause of religious freedom around the world. The summit is also held to increase public awareness and political strength for the international religious freedom movement. So they had a bunch of panelists from different religions, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. There might have been Buddhist and Hindu representation as well. But from the Muslim side, you had uh, three main people. You had Hamza Yusuf, you had Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya, and you had Imam Muhammad Majid. Imam Majid is from, or he works in, uh, Adam Center in Washington, the greater Washington area, Washington, D.C. area. And then you have Hamza Yusuf, who is at Zaytuna, his college in, in Berkeley, I believe. And then you have um, Bin Beya, who is, I think, currently residing in Dubai, uh, but he is actually uh, Moroccan in origin. So these are the three who are representing the Muslim side. And we're going to watch a clip of them talking about religious freedom. So Ibn Bayah presents himself as this kind of very traditional scholar, um, heavily into tasawwuf. So you'll see kind of what he has to say. سعادة رئيس الجلسة صديق القس بوب روبر سعادة السفير ديفيد سيبرسون فضيلة الإمام محمد ماجد أوضة بطريق القدس المحترم أصحاب المعالي أصحاب السعادة اسمحوا لي إذا كنت لم أذكر شخصا باسمه فإنكم جميعا في القلب قريبا من الدساء أيها الحضور الكريم اسمحوا لي أن أتوجه بجزيل شكر القائمين على هذا المؤتمر الدولي على الدعوة لهذا اللقاء الهام والتي تأتي تورأته لهذا العام برعاية منظمة حلم المغضوري الجديد إن هذه اللقاءات والمبادرات تريد بأن تحقق لنا بعض ما نصب إليه so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Sheikh began by praising God and all of the Prophets and our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, and then acknowledged uh, His Excellency, uh, the former Ambassador Sam Brownback for religious freedom, His Excellency uh, Ambassador David Saperstein, uh, His Excellency Imam uh, Muhammad Majid, His Excellency Pastor Bob Roberts, and then His Beatitude Theophilus III. Eastern uh, Orthodox Patriarch of, uh, Patriarch of Jerusalem. And then he apologized for any name he might have omitted, but he said all of you are in his heart. Peace and mercy and blessings of God be upon all of you. Allow me to express my sincere thanks to the organizers of this conference for convening this important meeting, which is sponsored this year by the New Alliance of Virtue among the sponsors. These meetings and initiatives are well-placed to realize the coalition, human fraternity, tolerance, and peace that we all seek especially with the presence of personalities such as my friend, His Excellency Ambassador Brownback, with his wisdom, experience, and openness. 
In this context, we also commend the efforts of the predecessor, Ambassador David Saverstein, and his successor, the current ambassador, Rashad Hussein, who are likewise highly capable and commendable leaders. Mr. Chairman, colleagues, distinguished audience, the title of this session that I, the, of my speech is Religious Freedom for the Good of All. Th this may stem from either the assumption that the availability of religious freedoms is in the interest of all, a hypothesis that needs to be tested and proved, and that the title is a call to make religious freedoms legitimately for the benefit of all. And this requires a mechanism as well as a theoretical and practical framework. So I'll address this topic by answering the following questions. The first, why do we believe that protecting religious freedom is in everyone's interest? What are the challenges to religious freedom and how can we push for religious freedom in the world? By answering and discussing these questions, our conference can tr contribute to a shared vision for advancing religious freedom worldwide. First, why do we believe that protecting religious freedom is in everyone's interest? All religions are at risk in various parts of the world, and it is therefore in their interest to join hands and defend one another. Religious freedoms of a particular religion should enjoy the support of other religions, as each one constitutes a majority in a certain part of the world, whilst it constitutes a minority in others. If it does not... So where is that in Islam? Like this idea that we have to protect all religions... And if there's a specific religion that's under threat, there there is a requirement for Muslims to really go and make sure that that religion is preserved. Because you have maybe this idea, okay, that there are people who are oppressed, who aren't Muslim, and they're just being killed, their land is being stolen, they're being ravaged by an unjust, oppressive force. And even if they're not Muslim, uh, there could be an Islamic justification for going and helping such people. Uh, but it's to help people. It's not to preserve a religion. It's not to preserve their religious beliefs. You're just trying to save them. And, you know, if their religious beliefs are wiped out, then fine. That could even be a good thing. Their religion is kufr, then that's a good thing. Um, that they would become Muslim, for example. And the whole idea of doing dawah, the whole idea of spreading Islam, calling to Islam, you are actively trying to decrease <laughs> the um, number of adherents to certain religions. And it, by its very nature, the idea of dawah it wants to reduce the amount of other religions in the world and increase the amount of Islam in the world, the adherence to Islam, adherence of Islam in the world. So the very concept of dawah, what what? So this is Hamza Yusuf translating uh, a pre-written speech from Bin Baya. Uh, the very concept uh, that he's the, the very thing that he's starting with, the very premise that he's starting with, is not only not supported by anything Islam. It actually actively contradicts the principle of dawah of of calling to Islam. But they want, to, you know, he's sitting there with his turban and his scarf and, oh, mashallah, what a traditional <laughs> imam. Cooperate with other religions in its religious, in its regions of influence. It may not cooperate in turn in areas where it forms a numerical minority. Thus, religious leaders must cooperate to ensure religious freedom for all. Globalization, which has seen the movement of goods and merchandise around the world, has witnessed a similar migration in ideas and peoples of different religions and beliefs. And thus there is hardly a land that belongs exclusively to one religion in the world today. Nonetheless, the purpose of protecting religion... There are uh, minorities in the Muslim world, for example, but that has always been the case. It's not something that is because of globalization. You do have many parts of the world that are dedicated to specific religions because the vast majority of the population are that religion. It's the West has been the most affected by globalization and immigration uh, and in terms of having large segments of the population that are not the dominant, you know, or the native quote unquote religion, um, the US, Europe and so forth. But in the Muslim world, in different parts of the Asian continent, the African or South American continent, look at Latin America. Um, it's predominantly Catholic Christian. You know, oh, we're talking about over 95 percent 
Um, so these are religious places. Like, why should, you know, just think of it from the perspective of a Catholic. Why should a Catholic in Brazil or Argentina uh, willfully decide that, okay, I'm going to put my religion on equal footing with Buddhism or Hinduism? Why would I do that? That doesn't make sense. Like, why would I subvert my religion and put everything on equal footing and have my country be dictated by atheistic liberal norms? Because that's ultimately what religious freedom is. Uh, people won't acknowledge it in those terms, but that's what religious freedom is. Religious freedom means rule by atheism. And the people who are most pining for religious freedom are atheists because they want a world that has no religion. And even if the world has religion, it needs to be something private. You know, it needs to be something that is in your home as a religious person, but I don't want to see it. I don't want to be dictated by it. My life doesn't need to have anything to do with your religion. So they want to secularize the whole world and push religion into the private domain. And even that is uh, no longer acceptable because you can't even dictate your own home according to religious belief. Uh, there are regulations against that in liberal countries like Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, where you can't eat halal meat even in your own home. Why? Because uh, the halal slaughter is something that's inhumane. Or you can't teach your children in the privacy of your own home that the importance of hijab, the importance of not engaging in premarital sexual relations, you can't teach that in the privacy of your own home because that's abusive, that is bigoted, that is misogynistic, you're contradicting uh, women's liberation. So even within your own home now, religion is not really applicable. So this this shows you know the the atheist secular project is to continue to reduce the scope of religion's applicability in, on human life or to human life. They took it out of the schools, they took it out of the public sphere, they took it out of government, and now they want to take it out of homes as well. Religion should just be something in the you know in the deepest part of your heart only. <laughs> Is, is your religious belief. And even then, actually, that's not in, enough because if you believe certain things, like if you believe that homosexuality is a sin, then that makes you a bigot and there's no place in society for bigots. <laughs> if you think that trans women are not women, then that means you're a bigot. It doesn't matter if that you hold that belief in the depths of your heart and you never express it you never you know you never even tell anyone about it that still makes you a bigot and that still if we could find a way technologically to identify the people who have such bigoted beliefs and criminalize that we would do it we would do it that's that's the liberal mentality and that's why they want to monitor because since they don't have the kind of mind reading technology to actually see that you know, you believe that women shouldn't be educated or, or don't, you know, need to be educated. Or you believe that, you know, in prayer, men should stand in front of women. Women should stand in the back, right? Um, they can't scan your your heart or your mind to, under, to see that you have these bigoted beliefs. Uh, so what they do is they just monitor your social media. That's the next best thing to mind you know, scanning your thoughts is seeing what you search for on the internet, who you're talking to, what you're saying on social media, what you're saying in your private chats, in your DMs. That's the best that they can get to mind control. And, you know, that's what liberal states do is constant surveillance, mass surveillance, data collection, data mining. So this is, so the Bin Beya and Hamza Yusuf, they're part of this uh, liberal hegemony they're the one they're part they're the religious face the 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 traditional islamic face of that massive surveillance machine that atheistic force that wants to wipe out religion off of the face of the earth they are part of that they're part of it knowingly or unknowingly but i think they know hamza yusuf is not a dummy uh he's not a he's not unfamiliar with liberalism he's not unfamiliar with the secular project. He's not unfamiliar with how all of this nonsense contradicts Islam. So you tell me what's going on. Religious freedom should not be based on a pragmatic calculation. It should stem first and foremost from a religious belief or principle, since all religions teach and in fact urge support for the oppressed 
and the protection of freedom of faith and practice. It is in fact one of the rights Ooh, of Islam that what? Islam grants human beings. The Holy Quran what? says there is no compulsion in the religion what? in 2256. Also, the prov provision of religious freedom is not merely important, but necessary to ensure coexistence and peace among human beings on earth. For there is no peace in the world without peace between religions, as the Swiss philosopher Hans Kuhn put it. Uh, so, so this is nonsense. You know, La ikraha fi din in Surah Al-Baqarah. As many, many people have noted, as I've noted on this channel, as we've noted on MuslimSkeptic.com, uh, through so many articles, um, and many have just pointed out this nonsense that no, la ikraha fiddin does not refer to this kind of liberal religious freedom. You're imposing a liberal uh, doctrine onto the Quran that the Quran itself does not promote. And this is understood uh, through the sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, like basic sirah or the actions of the salaf, you know, for at the earliest periods of Islam, what kind of religious freedom was established? You had uh, the concept of Ahlul Dhimma, uh, the protected people who had to pay jizya, who took a subservient or a lower status in society. Why? Because the law of the land is Islam. That's not religious freedom. The Prophet وسلم, did not establish the First Amendment in Medina. The Quran does not establish the First Amendment. And as you guys know from um, uh, The Great Lie, our course on liberalism, and we talk in depth about the First Amendment, how uh, there's your the Establishment Clause uh, and there's the Free Exercise Clause. The government is not going to establish any particular religion as the law of the land. That's, the, that's part of the First Amendment. The other part is the Free Exercise. The government is not going to prohibit uh, the free exercise of religion. Those two clauses within the First Amendment, you can analyze them um, and critique them and deconstruct them and show how they're not really applied. And we do that in our course on liberalism and religious freedom. But put that analysis aside, do we find that in Islam? <laughs> do we find that in the, uh, in the Islamic tradition? Do we see that in the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, of course, he. there was establishment, the establishment of Islam, the establishment of the Sharia. And everyone in society has to abide by the Sharia. Now, the Sharia does give space for non-Muslims to practice their faith, but it is in a very, it's in a defined scope that Islam defines. Islam defines how, to what extent you can practice your faith. So you can have your church, you can have your um, synagogue, you can have your Jewish school, you can have your rabbis, you can have your priests, you can have your celebrations, you can have your rituals. But can you proselytize? Can you go and try to convert Muslims to Christianity or Judaism? No, that is strictly prohibited. Can Muslims proselytize to Christians and Jews? Of course, <laughs> yes. So that would be considered a violation of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. You're, you're preventing the free exercise of proselytization on the part of non-Muslims, and you are allowing Muslims to go out and proselytize. And also, you are using funds um, that are collected, whether it's through zakat or it's through jizya, because Muslims don't have jizya. Muslims don't pay jizya. That is strictly for non-Muslims. And that jizya is going to go to the state, and the state in return gives protection to the dhimmis, to the ahlul dhimma, the protected people, the uh, non-Muslims. And But ultimately, that jizya is going to be used according to the interests and the imperatives of Islam and the interests of the Muslim nation. So this is a violation. Um this is a violation of the First Amendment and religious freedom. And there are so many examples. Like, look at the, uh, what is the first thing, or among the first things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did when he uh, conquered Mecca, or he opened Mecca, Fat Mecca. What is the first thing he did? He destroyed the idols in the Kaaba. He destroyed them. 
So where's the religious freedom in that? He he not only established Tawheed, therefore violating the establishment clause of the First Amendment. He also, by destroying the idols, he didn't he didn't just transfer them to somewhere else, to another location. <laughs> he destroyed them. So this is a violation. This is violating, or this is this is limiting the free exercise of Arab paganism by destroying their idols. Where is the religious freedom in that? Where is the religious freedom in that? So this, it's just anyone who has a basic understanding of not only the sirah, but of Islam itself cannot support religious freedom in the way that they are describing it and conceiving of it. The kalima itself, when you say la ilaha illallah, and you testify that there is no God except Allah, there is no object worthy of worship except Allah, That is how is that consistent with religious freedom? You're not respecting other religions. You're It's a denunciation of other religions. It's a repudiation of other religions. When you say, la ilaha illallah, this is not a, you know, feel good, kumbaya, peaceful, you know, let's hold, ha hold hands. La ilaha illallah is, is, is a serious repudiation. Now, you know, I'm not saying that that means we go and fight and uh, kill whoever. Obviously not. You know, we're not promoting violence just by saying la ilaha illallah. But the implications, okay, another way to put it is that Islam is hostile to other belief systems. That doesn't mean it's hostile to human beings. Because you can, uh, as I said, you can go and defend a minority or people who are oppressed who are non-muslim they're they're being oppressed they're being killed and, and the muslim state or the muslim nation would if imagine like islam is this dominant force in the world and you know there's a certain region that is experiencing conflict and there's one side that's committing a genocide and they're non-muslims would a Muslim nation using its power prevent that genocide just on the basis of that we don't want people just being killed? Uh, we don't want people being oppressed, even though they're, though they're not Muslim? <clears throat> yes, of course, the nation would intervene or there are grounds, Islamic grounds for that nation, the Muslim ummah to intervene to protect those non-Muslims, even when they're not, you know, there's not that kind of uh, interest uh, you know other motive ulterior motive in that in that kind of protection so but but that doesn't mean that we want to preserve religions we want to preserve people we want to fight oppression but sometimes religion uh, and oftentimes these religions of shirk these religions of idolatry of paganism that is the oppression that is the greatest oppression uh, so we're not going to <laughs> try to preserve idolatry and paganism and kufr like how is that a part of islam guaranteeing religious freedoms therefore contributes to understanding the joyful coexistence amongst all human beings what are the challenges that hinder the availability of religious freedoms the challenges facing religious freedom stem mostly from policies that regulate societies these may be policies that are hostile to all religions equally whether through an ideological basis, or they may be discriminatory policies based on historical accretions and cultural memory. Factors such as poor communication, ignorance of the other who follows a different religion, fear and apprehension of religion generally, and the inappropriate practices of some religious leaders due to selfish competition or bigotry likewise intensifies these challenges. Therefore, we can only deal with the obstacles to religious freedom effectively if we understand the factors affecting these policies, and we must deal with them rationally and conscientiously. Whilst we support and advocate for religious freedom, we believe that if it is founded on the solid ground of peace and within its context, it will be truly secure and sustainable. The freedom we call for is unconditional to the extent that it guarantees the observance of public order, social tranquility, and peace in every country. So the main... These kinds of religious freedom summits and uh, conferences, organizations that they have, it's mainly directed at the Muslim world. It's mainly directed at the Sharia, at, at the Sharia of Islam. 
because all of these other religions, major religions, have already liberalized to a, to a very large extent. Um, they have accepted democracy and uh, things like the First Amendment, religious freedom. Um, they've accepted things like individual rights. Uh, there's no debate uh, that you'll find uh, within these religions, um, at least on the at the high level, with you know the Pope, for example, disagreeing <laughs> that there needs to be this kind of secular order, um, or you know that's something that is just accepted, and it's the Muslim world that is the holdout. It's the Muslim world that still believes in the Sharia, still believes that look, we have. Um, these kinds of uh, policies that differentiate Muslims from non-Muslims and Islam needs to be prioritized in the Muslim world over other religions. And no, we're not going to just agree to secularize and liberalize. Muslims are the holdout. So all of these conferences, they're really directed at, at Muslims and Muslim nations to pressure Muslim nations to secularize increasingly adopt these kinds of human rights norms as defined by the liberal West. And Hamza Yusuf and Bin Baya and Muhammad Majid are just the talking heads. They know, like, and this has always been the strategy of liberalism to control the Muslim world, is you hire imams, you give them a, a nice sum of money, you wind them and dine them and, you know, fly them first class, and you have them talk about the beauty of Western values and how Western values are really Islamic values. Religious freedom is really an Islamic value that's, you know, in embedded in the Quran itself. All of these West women's rights is something as defined by the West, uh, the right of a woman to, you know, express herself sexually and not face any kind of shame or any kind of uh, public ridicule or punishment, that is a human right that's found directly in the Quran. Um, the freedom of all genders and orientation, sexual orientations to love is love, that is found directly in the Quran. This is something that we have to institute in every Muslim country because it's in the Quran. It's not an imposition of the West. This is us just expressing and rediscovering the values that are in our own scripture. In the Quran and Sunnah, this is always the argument, and it doesn't. It comes off as insincere and contrived and duplicitous if it's coming from a uh, a clean shaven uh, white man in a suit, right? Uh, bespeckled man, uh, you know, sitting behind a desk. <laughs> it comes off as okay. Who are you to be lecturing Muslims on what's in the Quran? But if you have, you know, this turban guy, bearded, he has a scarf because he's so traditional. Maybe he has a tasbih because he just is rem remembering Allah at all times. Uh, you know, even when he's at this religious summit and sitting there telling us about religious freedom, even then he's doing uh, tasbih. You know, that com that has a more of an influence on Muslims. That has more of an impact on Muslims. It comes off as more authentic. And this is a, a psyop. That's the other word. For it. It's a psyop. It's a psychological operation on the Muslim community. And we have to call it out. Finally, how do we push for religious freedom in the world? This requires continuous effort and broad ranging cooperation between religious leaders of different faiths through increasing mutual acquaintance between their followers and enhancing cooperation and joint initiatives between them. Likewise, dialogue and open channels of communication with policymakers are needed to raise awareness of the importance and value of religious freedom. The followers of each religion must also turn to their sacred text to highlight teachings that encourage coexistence and tolerance and to see their religious texts, history and heritage in new and open interpretive contexts that allow them to discover the foundations for coexistence therein. In this regard, they must so it's explicit. He's saying we need reform. <clears throat> we have to reform. We have new interpretive contexts. Reinterpret. Reinterpret our religious religious scripture according to new interpretive contexts. That's like a 
fancy way to say we need to reform our religions. We need to push these new interpretations, these reinterpretations. Uh, it's explicit. Like, <laughs> I mean, back in the day, you would have like before some of these sellouts were co-opted. The people who were talking about religious reform were like uh, these like Muslims for progressive values, for example, these lesbians, <laughs> these brown lesbians who are saying we want religious freedom and everyone should have the right to blaspheme against God. Everyone should have the right to, you know, be an atheist and Islamic law is so barbaric. We have to reform Islamic law. We have to reinterpret Islamic law to make it more conformant to uh human rights norms and uh, liberal freedom and secularism and feminism and LGBT. Like this was something not, I'm not talking about decades ago or a generation ago. I'm talking about when I was in my twenties, you know, I was in college. The people who were calling for religious freedom were literally, I mean, I'm not saying it as a joke. They were like lesbians and like these brown women who no hijab, openly drank alcohol, openly fornicated. They're Muslims, quote unquote, for progressive liberal values. That was like their organization or the progressive Muslim union. We're progressive. We want to advance Islam. Islam is backwards the way it is. We have to advance it with these new reinterpretive strategies. Now we have uh, the traditional Sufi sheikh <laughs> sitting and, and saying this in, in the English language. Uh, so yeah, if you go back uh, about 200 years, you do have the same thing. You have, I mean, this, as I refer to, this is not a new strategy of colonialism and imperialism to co-op the traditional sheikh pay him the money and have him preach the beauty of Western values. Uh, this goes back to someone like Muhammad Abdu. Uh, and you can read an excellent article on muslimskeptic.com about Muhammad Abdu and his working with uh, Cromer, Lord Cromer of you know the British colonial lord or colonial um, manager, governor in Egypt and how Azhar University was co-opted uh, and started preaching all of these liberal doctrines uh, for the benefit of the colonial power and how Muhammad Abdu was a part of that. And he dressed in a turban and a thobe uh, and a jubba and gave khutbah. So this is not something new, but in the English speaking context, <laughs> This is new. Like we haven't had these kinds of preachers like Hamza Yusuf, who is supposed to be so traditional. He's here preaching the same message as the progressive Muslim union or progressive Muslims, uh, Muslims for progressive values and so forth. So the comment here is like Irshad Manji, a Muslim lesbian who wrote a book called The Troubles with Islam. Yeah, the trouble with Islam or the problem of Islam, something like that. Irshad Manji, for example. Yeah, she's one of them. Another good comment, uh, I imagine Hamza Yusuf, Yusuf sitting side by side with Satanists calling for religious freedom or maybe a festival of faith ceremony. Yeah, I mean, uh, Hamza Yusuf and these these people sitting there uh, in their robes, Where where's the Satanist representation? Uh, it seems kind of uh, bigoted. Where's the religious freedom? I want to see Satanists. Let's actually see the consequences of these ideas okay? it's it's all you know honky dory and all really nice when you're sitting there at your cleaned up professional conference organized sitting there on you know professional audiovisual equipment you know bloviating about <laughs> religious freedom where's the satanist where where are the rastafarians <laughs> right where are these other groups like Baha'is, I mean, Baha'is would have no problem being there. Ismailis, where uh, where are the Qadianis? Where's the representation? Where are the five percenters? Where's the nation of Islam? <laughs> That's a good one, actually. Where Where is Louis Farrakhan? He needs to be, he, he's the spiritual he, leader of the nation of Islam, you know. So <laughs> where is he in these conferences? If you're truly preaching religious freedom, then all of these religions, even the anti-Semitic ones, <laughs> like Nation of Islam is considered to be anti-Semitic because, you know, they're 
against Israel and so forth. So where where is uh, Louis Farrakhan, Farrakhan and uh, the Nation of Islam at these conferences? There's no representation. So Hamza Yusuf needs to be fighting for <laughs> Nation of Islam. I mean, that's actually interesting because I think that Zaytuna had a Nation of Islam conference on their campus. Like they hosted a Nation of Islam conference and Imam Zaid Shaker gave a, a very moving speech about Elijah Muhammad, <laughs> the guy who claimed to be a prophet. So maybe one day you'll get to see that clip uh, when we release it, maybe. This is where religious freedom ends up. It leads to all kinds of kufr. Let's draw attention to the inspirational stories and models from their history whose recital may contribute to spreading the values of goodness and peace in the hearts of their adherents. In this context, I thank you for dedicating this session to discussing the contents of the historic 2016 Marrakesh Declaration promoting religious freedom in Muslim majority lands, which was jointly issued by the Abu Dhabi Forum for Peace and the Ministry of Islamic Affairs uh, in Morocco and adopted by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC. It is a model that should, could be, should be emulated by other religious leaders who are called to launch further initiatives aimed at protecting minorities in areas where uh, other religions are in the majority. Participants, the existential challenges faced by humankind increase the need to protect religious freedoms of followers of different faiths in many regions of the world. While we monitor from time to time threats to religion and religious sanctities in various regions, such as the burning of the Quran in Sweden and Denmark, we fear that these bigoted trends and extremist practices will overshadow the spirit of tolerance and joyful coexistence that we work and call for. So this uh, call, uh, speaking out against extremism is uh, a big part of this whole religious freedom. They have to call out extremisms in order to basically a CVE policy. It's basically a countering violent extremism policy, um, which is one of the tools of liberalism, again, used since the beginning of colonialism against Muslims and against Islam, saying that, look, if you have this kind of illiberal interpretation of Islam, you don't think that Islam in includes religious freedom. You're a believer in things like Ahlul Dhimma, Ahkam Ahlul Dhimma, the Jizya, for example. If you believe that um, uh, Jihad al Talab, you know, conquest is something legitimate in Islam, like on a theoretical basis, because obviously we don't have in a Khalifa or we don't have any kind of Muslim nation to do that in this day and age, but you just believe in that it's a valid concept and it's a part of Islam, you're an extremist. You are a uh, potentially violent extremist, and the government is justified in cracking down on you. The government is justified in banning you off of social media, restricting your speech, restricting your freedom of movement by putting you on no-fly lists. The government is justified in detaining you indefinitely, maybe preventively, you know, through preventative detention, because you potentially, not you have committed any crime, but potentially you could commit a crime because of the beliefs that you have. Uh, all kinds of penalties in order to disenfranchise, delegitimize, deplatform those who preach a non liberal or even anti liberal understanding of Islam. Uh, Bin Bayah uh, is a part of that. Hamza Yusuf is a part of that by virtue of working with these kind of government connected, government funded agencies and organizations. And I mean, Hamza Yusuf was deputized by the Trump administration. Like he was part of one of their religious freedom uh, groups. And Bimbeya obviously has ties with these Arab regimes that are pushing the same kind of agenda. So um, it's this is this is part of pushing religious freedom is pushing countering violent extremism, CVE, um, and targeting quote unquote extremists in order to delegitimize them because they understand that the extremists, what they call as extremists, are the ones who are really going to damage uh, their message. They're going to damage their credibility. When I go and do a stream on these compassionate imams or these sellouts, and I will cite Quran, I'll cite Hadith, I'll remind Muslims of, look, this is what religious freedom actually means, this is what they're actually doing, and this is what they want to implement. That is a threat to their project. So there's a target on my back. Um, and, you know, you can see the kinds of things that they say about me. And alhamdulillah, it hasn't gotten to a point where it's dangerous for me because of living in the U.S. 
But if I were living in one of these other countries, the authorities would be knocking on my door. You know, the authorities would be knocking on my door and Allahu alam, what could happen in that kind of case. But I would fall under the under the umbrella of what Bin Baya is describing as an extremist. That's something to, you know, everyone should realize. Anyone who lives in the Muslim world knows that you can't, even like having a beard that is too long uh, can put you on a watch list, can put you as a target by you just growing your beard. And so you have in the Muslim world, many Muslims who believe that it's necessary, obligatory to have a beard of at least a fist length long, if you can, or more. And but they are just either trimming their beard or cutting it very close because they leg, there's a legitimate concern that you're going to be put in prison or worse uh, just for having a longer beard or your wife is you know wearing naqab that can be a potential problem. So this is what is this other than liberal oppression? What is this other than liberal tyranny and forcing? liberal values onto Muslims, imposing it and under threat of all kinds of death and destruction and sanction. You know, that's what religious freedom is, that you should understand it as this monstrous project. Our country, the United Arab Emirates, represents a model where dozens of different religions, cultures and races coexist. Hundreds of nationalities living in security, safety and respect. UAE hosted the signature of hundreds of religious leaders to the charter of the new alliance of virtue. One of the most important initiatives that should be jointly pursued by religious leaders, the United Nations and decision makers around the world are laws protecting places of worship from damage and desecration because they are places where God is worshiped and his name is praised. The Quran said, if we did not repel some people by means of other people, many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques, wherein God's name is much invoked, would have been destroyed. God is sure to help those who help God's cause. God is all powerful and almighty. The issue of re religious freedom is neither Eastern nor West. Yeah, so that's something that is part of Ahkam Ahlul Dhimma, the rulings on Ahlul Dhimma, is that their places of worship are preserved. Um, and the Muslim authorities protect those places of worship, like the churches and the synagogues. They're protected from, so, you know, you have in, in these liberal European countries, often churches are attacked um, because the churches have some kind of anti-LGBT policy. Not like they have a policy, but they, you know, they're not fully celebrating uh, LGBT. Therefore, they're considered bigots and terrorists. And then you have... These liberals, the secularists going and smashing up the church, you know, or putting like feces in the church, um, all kinds of desecration. That's something that you see constantly, regularly on uh, happening in Europe and increasingly in America. When uh, the Supreme Court case uh, regarding Roe v. Wade, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, there was this call to attack churches. <laughs> no one was convicted for terrorism or any kind of charges like that, or violent extremism like that. Oh, you're you're targeting churches because they oppose abortion. Uh, but that there was a call, like on social media, very prominent. So that kind of thing would not be allowed in a Muslim nation. The caliphate would not allow there to be calls of destruction of churches or synagogues because they're protected. And part of jizya, part of the kind of tax that is paid by non-Muslims in the Muslim nation is used to protect uh, those Christians and Jews, uh, protect their property, protect their churches and their places of, of worship. And, and also those Christians and Jews don't have to fight in wars to defend the borders, to defend the land. I mean, that's why is that the case? You know, that's something that is a major dispensation for Christians and Jews. Like you don't have obligatory military service. That doesn't exist in any kind of liberal country. There's no guarantee in these liberal countries. You have to pay all kinds of taxes that are far beyond anything that the caliphate has ever charged in terms of jizya for Christians and Jews. But despite paying all those taxes, you also have to go and fight wars <laughs> you know you have to fight wars for the liberal state there's conscription mandatory conscription at times there's the draft at times that are, that can become mandatory at any time you have no 
no choice. So, and, and also with these secular Arab countries as well, with 90% Muslim population, but you have Christians in those countries as well. So Egypt, for example, there are Coptic Christians. They have to serve in e Egypt's army services, I believe. There is two years that you have to do. Uh, other countries as well. Iran has mandatory uh, military service that you do, usually when you're 18, between 18 and 22 years old. I, I don't believe Jews and Christians are exempt from that. Maybe. Uh, I haven't reviewed exactly the details. But th this is just on the basis of secularism, like this idea of mandatory military service. But in Islam, there's actually more leeway to the religious minority. So this is the big differences. What they're preaching is not an Islamic understanding of toleration. Toleration exists in Islam, but it comes with a certain kind of nuance. I'll, I'll explain that more in a second. It is not specific to rich countries nor democracies, all of which have had their share of successes and failures. Rather, discrepancy is in the pursuit of religious freedom in the most effective way possible. There is an urgent need to activate the charter of the new alliance of virtue by religious leaders to support the oppressed. In conclusion, we hope that our joint efforts here will satisfy the need for understanding, dialogue, and the search for commonalities. May it serve as a general invitation to people of goodwill to unite to preserve the flame of hope for a better future for the great human family. Thank you. Peace be upon all of you. I'm a Baptist pastor. Why is there like this kind of salam alaikum to a non Muslim audience? Seems to be become very common nowadays. You see compassionate imams, they just extend salam to non Muslims. That's not allowed. So the the fanboys will say, oh, but in his heart, he is only in, intending it for the Muslims. <laughs> Okay, I mean, this is unfortunate distortion, like the level of distortion of Dean that we see is unbelievable. You're from Texas, and I love Sheikh Bin Baya. At the end there, that was Bin Baya, or uh, what's it, Bob Roberts. Leaders, the United Nations. All right, so tolerance. So yeah, there is tolerance in Islam, but I've already described the kind of tolerance that exists. Is a tolerance that... Uh, you have the scope of tolerance is defined by Islam. It's not defined by atheism. Uh, that means that everyone is subservient to Islam, Islamic rule of law. That's a big difference between liberal tolerance and Islamic tolerance. Uh, under liberal secular tolerance, everyone is subservient to an atheistic law, atheistic worldview. There's no any kind of religious practice that contradicts what is defined as atheistic tolerance will get crushed. So your religion teaches um, patriarchy. Your religion teaches that there are certain gender roles. Well, that contradicts the atheistic, feministic imperative. So you have to reform your religion. You won't be able to practice patriarchy. Your religion calls for you know certain kinds of punishments, criminal punishments, well, you're living in an atheistic country you, or a secular country. You cannot practice those aspects of your religion. Too bad. I'm sorry. You know, that's barbaric. You know, the idea of hudud or the idea of you're punishing uh, criminals using capital punishment. The death penalty is now seen as something completely barbaric. So too bad. You don't get to practice those aspects of your religion. Uh, your religion is anti-homosexuality too bad you know you need to legalize gay marriage you need to decriminalize homosexuality your religion thinks that there are only two genders too bad you know that's not that's intolerant that's intolerant so someone like Hamza Yusuf will say that no 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 we're only preaching religious freedom because we want to protect religions against this liberal onslaught we want to protect we want to make sure Islamic schools and Catholic schools don't have to teach you know, LGBT to kindergartners. That's what they'll claim. But the problem is the kind of tolerance that you're invoking and the concept of hate that you're invoking, uh, that's going to be used eventually against exactly what you're supposedly trying to protect Muslims from. That liberal definition of tolerance, if you adopt it, it's going to uh, condemn Islam for its anti-LGBT stances, its anti 
feminist stances and positions and policies. So it's like you're trying to, uh, you know, drink the antidote or take an antidote for poison, but the antidote is poison itself. Or you're taking the poison itself. How, how does that make any sense? You're adopting these concepts and these terms. Now, as far as cooperation, should, can Muslims cooperate with non-Muslims like Christians and Jews? Can there be like an understanding and a, an agreement between different religious groups? Yes. But it has to be on the basis of uh, actual Islamic values, not liberal values. So when Hamza Yusuf, Majid, and uh, Bin Bayya, and this Orthodox uh, father, this Catholic, Protestant, whatever, rabbi come together, they're coming together on the basis of religious freedom, which is a liberal value. This idea of individual liberty, individual freedom, these are liberal values. They're not Islamic values. They're not Orthodox Christian values or Catholic or, or Orthodox Jewish values. Um you have to reform re and reinterpret, as Bin Bayya said. You have to reinterpret your religion to make it conformant to that kind of liberal value. Uh, so we reject that. That is a distortion of deen, and that leads to further colonization um, and uh, submission of the Muslim world to the liberal powers. But there can be cooperation on the basis of things that are maruf, things that are known to be good. They're not necessarily individual individualistic values, but values like the importance of marriage between man and woman. That's something that's shared with all the all religions, all traditional religions. Um, the value of family, the value of mother and father and children, the value of wider family relations, the value of honesty, the value of you know these kinds of values the value of god believing in god um, that is something that is shared amongst religion so if you have that kind of understanding of value then why would you advocate for religious freedom when religious freedom isn't going to empower atheists to constantly criticize your religions and attack your religions and blaspheme your religion and attack your churches attack your imams defame you defame your people why would you support that kind of religious freedom? That's not, if we want to cooperate with Christians and Jews, okay, let's cooperate to silence the atheists. Let's cooperate to silence the blasphemers, to disenfranchise the blasphemers. Uh, disenfranchise, so I'm not advocating any violence, but we want to uh, disenfranchise those voices, not empower them. So we want to preserve belief in God, in society. That's better than atheism and liberal atheism and Satanism and these kinds of things that are spreading. We can cooperate co cooperate on the protecting the innocence of childhood. No LGBT instruction. We don't want, um, you know, these kinds of things being taught in schools. So this is something that there can be cooperation on. And there have been Christians who have approached me and said, Daniel, you know, we really like uh, what you're doing online, your website, your YouTube channel, your Facebook page, blah, blah, blah. You really stand up. You have these good critiques of LGBT and feminism, uh, etc. We want you to, we want to work with you. We want to invite you to our conference. We want to invite you to this organization. Uh, and these are religious freedom organizations, uh, as I found out. So when they invited me, I go and look them up. I see that, oh, you're calling for religious freedom in the Muslim world specifically. I'm not going to work with you. I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Like, you're going to just use me. Uh, so this is what they do. They recruit. They look for Muslims uh, who traditional who are orthodox and they want to co-opt them and say yeah we're on your side we really you know like your message on these social issues on these kinds of political issues we want to work with you we want to support you we want to fund you but that kind of funding it comes with a 
it comes with a price. You know, it's a uh, quid pro quo. We scratch your back, you scratch ours. You need to advocate for religious freedom. So how do how did I respond to them? I said, forget it. <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And yeah, these are these are organizations that are connected to Hamza Yusuf as well and, and others. <laughs> so yeah, because the religious freedom as a project, it's very obvious what it is. It's spreading liberalism and atheism. We need to look at Bob Roberts now, just to close this out and then get to the open Q and A. So at, at this conference, it was mediated by this guy named Bob Roberts. So there's Bob Roberts on the right and Majid in the center. And like, they're all on the same stage. Yeah, that's all of them together. I think that's a rabbi in the center, maybe. Bob Roberts is like a Protestant Christian. So let's see what Majid says, actually. The reality is you had a lot to do with Marrakesh Declaration, a whole lot to do with it. Behind the scenes, before it became public, <laughs> connecting a lot of the players together, you, you, you deliberately brought other people into that. Why was it so important to you? Why, why, did, why did you do that? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Bob of telling people what I'm wearing. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, the, our, my teacher, Sheikh uh, Ben Beya, uh, I have just uh, explained to us the importance of religious freedom from a Islamic perspective. As an imam uh, living in America, leading a community in the United States, we have seen religious community in this beautiful country stood beside us. A difficult time. I was the uh, vice president of ISNA, some state of North America, and there was a burning Quran incident in Florida, like you just now have it in Sweden. And the Jewish community, the Christian community, and Hindus and Sikh and everyone uh, decided to stand beside us and actually created an organization shoulder to shoulder to uh, uh, protect Muslim rights in this beautiful country. Uh, that makes me think about what can we do to also to protect uh, religious minorities in the majority of Muslim countries. And thank God, we're led by one of the most respected uh, scholars, the scholar of scholars, uh, Sheikh Bembeya, who brought uh, uh, Muslim scholars around him uh, in south from Georgetown to uh, Mauritania to Tunisia and into Morocco, where I have 250 Muslim scholars actually signed into that document. Uh, this document now is a document that we use of training uh, imams and hopefully made it to curriculum and adopted by 20, uh, 57 Muslim countries, no IC. But it means a lot. So you see how they are just exporting this really rapidly um, in the OIC countries, 57 different countries, they're training imams uh, so this is a very significant project. How many millions of dollars are required to train people like this? Who's who's bringing this money? Like, where is this kind of money coming from um, to hold these kinds of events and hold these kinds of trainings, to recruit, uh, to network? So this is a major operation. We're not talking about like some kind of mom and pop thing here. Uh, this is international millions of dollars of funding. And uh, he mentioned the thing about Quran burning. Like Quran burning is such a s silly example because, yeah, obviously we hate that people disrespect the Quran. Uh, but does that mean like in order to stop Quran burning, we have to like destroy the practice of what the Quran teaches? Like that is the bigger crime. The bigger crime is to abolish the Sharia and to reform the Sharia, re reinterpret the Quran in new interpretive context. That is the bigger crime because you are actually violating the contents of the Quran. A non-Muslim disrespecting the Quran, yeah, it's something very vile, evil. But what is more evil is destroying the practice of the Sharia, the law of Allah, the commandments of Allah, violating them by secularizing Muslim nations and by allowing, you know, by building like these kinds of 
monuments to paganism that we see uh, in some of these Muslim countries, countries that haven't seen any kind of pagan idol erected. And now these pa these idols are being erected in the name of religious tolerance and religious freedom. Oh, we need to have this kind of temple to Shiva uh, right in the middle of the heart of the Middle East, the Arab world, these Muslim countries. We have to. That's what religious freedom requires. We have to have an atheism society. We have to allow... You know, if you truly allow religious freedom, then burning the Quran is something that you have to allow as well. That's an expression of religious freedom. Because some religions think that the Quran is evil. Some religions think that the Quran is the epitome of, of evil. So you have to have the right to criticize it and sometimes desecrate it, defame it, blaspheme against it. That's part of religious freedom so if you're going to spread religious freedom you're going to be spread quran burning you're going to be spreading the burning of the quran so this is these are the kinds of contradictions uh in speech from these so-called imams and if it's a matter of like okay well what about certain countries that mistreat religious minorities well yeah we see them muslims have been the biggest object of oppression in the past 200 years throughout the world and we have this whole mgap series muslim genocide awareness project where we bring to light using academic sources the kinds of genocides that have taken place against muslims in places like indonesia and in places like algeria and so forth um, so muslims are the victims of all kinds of oppression Look at what's happening to the uyghurs look at what ha what's happening to uh indian muslims by the BJP, look at what's happening to Kashmir, look at what's happening to Palestinians. Are these imams really advocating for those Muslims that are being oppressed and persecuted? Do you see Hamza Yusuf or Bin Baya or Imam Majid advocating? Where, where have they really advocated for these groups? You don't see that. Why? It's very obvious from what we just played. Like They are being sponsored by governments. You know, they're being sponsored by certain Arab governments that they mentioned. You know, Bin Baya's speech mentioned this specific country. And those countries are allied with Israel. They're allied with China. They're allied with the BJP in India. And so they're not going to be advocating for those Muslim minorities. That's why I'm telling you, like, this kind of advocacy for religious freedom is just for the purpose of secularizing um, uh, the Muslim world. That's the only purpose of it. Uh, and all of this talk about, oh, we want to protect Muslim minorities. Yeah, BS. Like, Muhammad Majid doesn't care about Muslim minorities. Trust me. Trust me on that one. This guy here also, like you, have been helping us in addressing the issue of Islamophobia in America. And therefore, as you stand beside us, we want to stand beside minorities in the majority Muslim countries. And therefore, the Sheikh is our leader in that. And all of us, we uh, really appreciate this document now. Uh, grounded in the Islamic tradition, because based oh. on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the charter mm -hmm. of, of Medina. For it's very dear to me, the Marrakesh Declaration. Yeah, nonsense, constant nonsense. Like it's grounded in the Islamic tradition. Yeah, nonsense. Um, if if that's if that vision of religious freedom is really what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, implemented, then why did he destroy the idols in the Kaaba? For example, why did he implement the jizya? Why did why does the Quran command jizya? For example, and you know you, you can't explain you can't explain these kinds of things. You can't explain the, the, these traditional imams. They just gloss over it. They don't talk about it. They don't mention these hadith. They don't mention um, these verses of the Quran. They just spam certain verses. They're I mean not, they don't spam the verses. They spam their misreading of ayat of the Quran. And that's all they do. And like I said, they don't like Islamophobia. Like, what is the Islamophobia that we're experiencing? Like, Islamophobia means, oh, I was at a restaurant and the waiter, like, I had a hijab on, and the waiter kind of rolled her eyes. <laughs> I've been oppressed. I'm persecuted. <laughs> that's the that's the Islamophobia that we're talking about. This is this is what we're destroying our religion for. This is what we're secularizing Islam for because American Muslims. Like Imam Majid, he goes, and it's not, sometimes it's just like the perception. 
okay, these uh, social justice warriors, these woke feminists, like, oh, you know. Here's an example of Islamophobia that I was hearing the other day. Like, someone is saying that, oh, I feel so uh, marginalized as a Muslim. You know, I was in college, I was in this class, and I have my hijab on, and the, there was another student who asked me, oh, why do you wear that? And oh, that was so bigoted. I don't have to explain to you why I wear the hijab. I don't have to, ex I don't ex owe you anything. I don't owe you an explanation. You know, it's, it's just the honest question, like, okay, what is the basis of the hijab? Why are you wearing hijab? But she took that as some attack, like some Islamophobic attack. Meanwhile, meanwhile, you have Uyghurs being thrown into re-education camps, and you have Palestinians and Syrians and Kashmiris. So this is this is the Islamophobia that we have to fight, you know. <laughs> fighting Islamophobia means we're fighting for a world where no woke hijabi gets offended at any time. <laughs> doesn't even, you know, get a whiff of disrespect, you know. <laughs> that's like, that's the level of Islamophobia. Meanwhile, you know, the kinds of policies by these liberal countries that systematically destroy Islam, you know, because you're required to teach LGBT, you're required to teach feminism. If you don't teach these things, even in your household, we're going to take your children like Sweden does with their social where they child protective services come and take children because their parents are teaching them, you know, that LGBT is wrong. Homosexuality is a sin. Premarital sex is a sin. Kids are being, con that's not an attack on Islam. That's not Islamophobia. <laughs> it's not Isl Islamophobia that, you know, if you teach certain verses of the Quran, you're going to be categorized as a hate preacher by these liberal governments you're going to be put on a no watch a no fly list you're going to be put on a watch list you're going to be surveilled that's not islamophobia <laughs> these countering violent extremism policies aren't islamophobia where if you say that yeah i think uh, a man having multiple wives is a, is a good thing that's not islamophobia it's not Isl islamophobia to have you know these laws that allow uh, polyamory, like you can have a three men together, and that can be that can count as a marriage. But if you have a man and two women, no, that is that is patriarchy and it's outlawed. That's bigamy. That's not that's not Islamophobia. <laughs> no, Islamophobia is like the hijabi getting asked why does she wear her hijab, and in a very neutral way, not even like an attack. Like, can you just explain? I'm just curious. That's the kind of Islamophobia that we have to we have to gut all of the Sharia. We have to nullify all of the Sharia to make it conformant with the UN human rights standards of religious freedom, because we're we're fighting Islamophobia. And then this is another argument that these bots and NPCs will constantly make: is that well, oh, you have Islamic, you have the freedom to have an Islamic school, and you have the freedom to proselytize in the West, but you don't want to allow the same exact things in the Muslim world. That's that's hypocrisy. So we've addressed this many times. Uh, the course on religious freedom that we have at Alessna Institute addresses this argument. But it's a nonsense argument. Like, religious freedom is not our value. Religious freedom is your value. And as I said, religious freedom means prioritizing atheism, making atheism the basis of the legal system and social policy and, and so forth. So if you value atheism, then you consider all religions to be equally false or equally true. It doesn't matter. Um so that's your value. You want to implement that. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, but why should we value? We don't value that. We don't value that. So it's not like a you scratch our back, we scratch your back type of reciprocity. Like that's not the situation. Like we don't believe that all religions are equal. We don't think that atheism is the same as uh, religion 
or we don't think that Islam is the same as Christianity, Islam is the same of, as Judaism. An atheist thinks that, or a secular person, a secularized person thinks that oh, all religions are the same. Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, they're all the, they're all the same in the sense that they're religions, therefore they should be all treat, be treated equally. But we don't have that conception. It, not all religions are the same. Islam is not the same as these other religions. So why should we treat them the same according to our legal system? That would be inconsistent on our part. We would only accept that if we adopted your secular premise that all religions are the same, therefore they should all, all be treated equally. We don't accept that premise. We reject that premise. So if you want to read more about that, um, go to muslimskeptic.com. We have an article about these kinds of temples being built in the Muslim world and this kind of argument specifically. Okay, so uh, go, you can watch the rest of the video um, on your own. I also want to point out Bob Roberts. He's kind of the one who has been pushing, or he's one of these World Economic Forum uh, fellows. And I had a thread on my Telegram channel that I'll open up for you. and Because so, I want to show you how entrenched these people are. Like Bob Roberts, pushing religious freedom. If you go to uh, my YouTube channel also, Muslim Skeptic, there is a video called Dark Legacy about Yasser Qadi and Omar Sulaiman and the ICNA conference. And Bob Roberts was one of the speakers there pushing all kinds of nonsense. Um, here's a good video. So this is a um, session that they had. No, is this on? Yeah, it's Hamza. So that's Bob Roberts and Hamza so Yusuf. That you are here tonight and that you decided to come to a prayer service. Multi-faith prayer service. We're going to reflect. We're going to celebrate who God is in our life. And we're going to pray also, especially for the Rohingya tonight and what they have gone through as all of our faiths come together. As we begin our service, I'm excited to introduce to you Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He is the vice president. So this is something completely the impermissible in Islam to have a multi-faith uh, prayer. Uh, the Honorable uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayan. He's also uh, the founder of Zaytuna College, the first and only accredited a Muslim college in America and it's beautiful. I was there last week as it looked as I looked over the bay and uh, he is one of the most renowned Islamic scholars in the world. So I'm so, so excited. Bin Bayah is there, Hamza Jim Yusuf Warren is there, Imam 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 is there, the same group. So again, like using Quran to promote what is clearly against the Quran and clearly violates Islam to have like a multi-faith prayer. Like you're in, you are joining the rituals of another religion. You are joining in the kufr of another religion. Um, this is a repudiation of Islamic belief. How can you say la ilaha illallah and then you're engaged in a practice of worship with another religion, like in their ritual. And a lot of Muslims are not aware of this. Like as a Muslim, you can't go to a Christian prayer service. Um, you can't go, like if, if you're a Muslim, you can't go to and participate in a synagogue uh, ceremony, a religious ceremony. You can't participate because their worship is being there in the building, joining in singing or chanting or just being present that is a that is a place of kufr and shirk you cannot engage in that as a muslim that is completely impermissible and it threatens your iman um so this is well known like there's no difference of opinion on this yet you have these oh traditional imams they are going to have, you know, this multi-faith prayer service. Great Baptist preacher, wouldn't he? Quoting all those Bible verses. <laughs> so we're excited to have Adams B, the children, children's choir, 
uh, from Adams Islamic Center, and then when they're through, uh, you'll be hearing from the First Baptist Church. Leonardo. So, oh, there's the hijabi who's going to lead these children to sing a Jewish song about peace. Blah blah blah. Oh, salam, salam. We love salam. Okay. Yeah. So that's you know, this is the kind of distortion of Dean that we find. Bob Roberts. Let me just show you how connected he is to the Dawa Mafia. So he is a World Economic Forum fellow, Dr. Bob Roberts, senior pastor of Northwood Church. So World Economic Forum, look at the kind of people that he's, or look at the agenda of the World Economic Forum, you know, the kind of articles that they publish. A gay imam story, the dialogue is open in Islam. Ten years ago, it wasn't. So pushing uh, gay imams. Meet the imam of America, of Africa's first gay-friendly mosque, World Economic Forum. What does it mean to be a Muslim woman? A new book is challenging the stereotypes. So just pushing like reform. This is standard. This imam, so Bob Roberts is tweeting, this imam Yasser Qadi gets it. If you're an evangelical and you want to follow an imam, he's a good one to follow. He understands the concept of multi-faith and practices it with class and precision. <laughs> So Bob Roberts has visited Yasser Qadi's masjid and, you know, pushing pushing this kind of multi-faith kufr uh, side by side with Yasser Qadi. Building bridges between Islam and evangelicism or evangelism. Evangelical visits Muslims at a mosque, a conversation, Pastor Bob Roberts and Dr. Yasser Qadi. So this is on Yasser Qadi's channel promoting this guy. Religious groups stand together after Texas synagogue standoff. So Omar Sulaiman and Bob Roberts are two peas in a pod. Uh, <laughs> you guys probably were not surprised by that. Uh, how the National Prayer Breakfast sparked an unusual meeting between Muslims in, and evangelicals. So there's Imam Majid and Bob Roberts in D.C. They both have been deputized by different government agencies and have served on different government organizations they're at the national prayer breakfast so that is a function of i think the white house and the washington post is reporting on it this kind of kumbaya story oh muslims and christians together uh bold love this is an interview imam muhammad majid rabid rabbi david saperstein and bob roberts there in the middle episode on friendship and something else you have to be sincere in relationship, even if you might not see. I don't know what that means. This is his bold. This is his podcast, Bold Love. Imam Majid, Pastor Bob Roberts, and Rabbi Lustig at the Forum for Peace in Abu Dhabi, after receiving awards for our work on the American Caravan for Peace, bringing Jews, Christians, and Muslims together. So another government function. This is obviously a pure Zionist. <laughs> But they're all smiling and holding hands. Oh, look at the friendship, guys. Look at the friendship. Bob Roberts having a good time with Hamza Yusuf. Uh, more Yasser Qadi and Bob Roberts at East Plano Islamic Center, that masjid. Yasser Qadi's masjid. Having a conversation about what, I wonder, about the details of fiqh or about new interpretive contexts. I wonder which which one. Uh, here is Bin Beya and... Bob Roberts, this has been Baya's son, I believe, and a rabbi, a couple of rabbis, I guess. Bob Roberts tweeting about Sheikh Ben Baya will go down in history in 20th century for building a nation, but 21st century for being one of the greatest peacemaker, peacemakers ever. So, you know, <laughs> take your peacemaker recommendations from an evangelical World Economic Forum, Forum operative. Yeah, we need the World Economic Forum to define for us who's a good imam. Who is a good sheikh, you know, the greatest peacemaker. These are the people that should recommend to us who to follow as Muslims. Here's another Alliance of Virtue meeting. Hamza Yusuf, Bin Baya, Majid, Roberts, like peas in a pod. 
Uh, this is the Bold Love Podcast, Dispelling Ignorance and Pursuing Peace. Hamza Yusuf and Bob Roberts. Muslims and Evangelicals. Seems like the same dialogue or another one with Yasser Qadi. Bob Roberts. So this is a description. Bob has been a trailblazer in the peacemaking and international religious freedom arenas. He is frequently called upon by the U.S. Department of State, United Nations, United U.S. Islamic World Forum, World Economic Forum, ambassadors, international royal families, diplomats, policy leaders, and others for his groundbreaking work in this field. Wow, seems like a really important guy. He seeks to build and execute a, a model whereby multi-faith and church planting combine to create flourishing cities. Bob has had the honor of engaging in bridge building efforts in Saudi, Vietnam, Israel, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Egypt, West Bank, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, Mexico, Brazil, Australia, and others. On behalf of the U.S. State Department, <laughs> the U.N. and the World Economic Forum. Wow, this is really quite an impressive CV. Uh, here is El Hibri Foundation. Uh, this is a liberal organization giving their Peace Award recipients. Pastor Bob Roberts. Wow, he got an award from, <laughs> from this uh, liberal group. And Dadia Mugahed, obviously. Obviously. Uh, Global Faith Forum 2021. Unlikely allies building flourishing communities. So Hamza Youssef is there. Bob Roberts. Imam Majid. Uh, Sam Brownback is there, a bunch of different liberals. Muhammad Isa is there, if you know who that is. Uh, very important, influential figure in Saudi. <laughs> uh, much more can be said, but I'll save it. Uh, here's another reaching, persuadable Americans. Why engaging conservatives matters. Dalia Mugahed, Anwar Khan, and Pastor Bob Roberts. Uh, so this is something, ISNA is organizing this. Anwar Khan, I believe, is with Islamic Relief. So, the, you know, a lot can be said about Islamic Relief. Bold Love Podcast with Dalia Mugahid. Another forum for promoting peace in Muslim societies. Yeah, promoting peace in Muslim societies means abolish the Sharia, is, abolish Islamic law, secularize, liberalize. That's the whole message. Get some new interpretations and new interpretive context uh prayers great to attend multi-faith prayer service for the persecuted prayers from muslim jewish christian and buddhist traditions that was what we just heard with the singing children singing about salam in hebrew want to hear a muslim scholar on Im the importance of working together with christians and others in the community ingrid matson former president of isna was on the Interfaith Task Force for White House, uh, and now the Horma Project. We have an article on Horma Project on Muslim Skeptic, if you're interested in that trash. Yeah, Ingrid Matson, the only American Muslim that I know who was praised by a former director of the CIA. <laughs> so you can check out my Telegram channel for that video. But that's Ingrid Matson, major liberal reformist as well. Uh, Omar Soleiman, Bold Love Podcast. Justice is a faith term more than it is a secular term. You hear Bob Roberts talk with Omar Soleiman on Bold Love Podcast, an interesting conversation between a pastor and an imam on faith's role in justice. They cover like the spectrum, right? The political spectrum. Because Ham Hamza Yusuf is considered more on the conservative side, right? On the American political spectrum. And Omar Soleiman is more on the left side. But both of them are down for, you know, interfaith, multi-faith conversation with neighbors, with Bob Roberts, right? So that's why you keep seeing the same names over and over and over again. So grateful for Dahlia, you know. So Dahlia Mugahed is also considered to be more on the left, on the left side, promotes her. Ingrid Matson is considered to be, you know, more center, maybe center right. Incredibly grateful for Omar Suleiman, a man of strong integrity and courage. He's a young imam to keep your eyes on. <laughs> People are taking their imam recommendations from Bob Roberts, their peacemaker recommendations. and so This is uh, from Telegram if you want to go and check it out. But yeah, it's a network. It's important to understand this network and how they operate, the kind of language they use. 
this is a psyop against the Muslim community, pure and simple. And I criticize certain figures because they're a part of the network. Like they are, they are being, they are betraying the Muslim community. Like how, how can this be anything other than a betrayal? And it's not just like one thing. It's a repeated pattern. They're part of the same network. So of course they need to be called out. You people need, Muslims need to be warned against, against them. May Allah protect us from these plots.